All right, everybody, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. We are right uh, maybe about a minute late, so I want to make sure our speakers have enough time to get through and we leave time for questions at the end. So uh, let's get rolling while people start filtering in. Uh, my name is Jeff Ciardo. I'm the Director of User Experience at Element 84, and uh, this is toward Better Earth Science UX. Uh, we've got a really great panel of speakers today, uh, Mark, Grega, Amy, Tyler. Um, they're going to be talking about all aspects of user experience as it relates to uh, earth science and uh, this, this field that we all work in. Uh, and then at the end, we're going to leave a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, and I think that that should be about it. I've got a, a quick little uh, couple of slides I'm going to go through just to get everyone focused on what we're going to be talking about. And then we're going to start in with the, uh, with the session. So this is a uh, a percentage that we like to sort of flash around a lot. We've used this in other talks, uh, but the 60% number represents uh, the time uh, a scientist spends prepping data before they can actually start to do any real science or ask any real questions on that data. Uh, this was from a 2011 NASA ROSES study, so it's a little old, but I feel like we give it at least a decade to still hold true. Uh, and until somebody shows me some data that uh, that sort of contradicts this, um, we're going to sort of go with it. So uh, the quote from the paper is, it has been observed that scientists and engineers spend more than 60% of their time just preparing data. So all of that time spent not doing any actual science, not doing any actual research. They're just manipulating data, getting it ready, downloading it, pre preparing it for uh, to help them answer the types of questions that, uh, that they want to ask. And so this is generally my motivation for why we should care about UX as it relates to earth science, because even small incremental changes, uh, getting that down to 50%, 40%, 30% time spent on prepping data opens up more time for, you know, doing actual science, longer lunches, nice casual conversation in the hallway, things like that. And so this is sort of the motivation for at least having some focus on the user experience of the systems that we're building, the user interfaces that we put together, uh, and the data standards and, and APIs that we build. So the first step to a better user experience is to understand your user's experience. And I think this is often overlooked when we, we go into develop systems. I don't think that's universally overlooked, but uh, design and user experience are often sort of uh, the first things to get pushed down or the smallest team, or they're often overlooked sort of at the uh, expense of the greater project. Uh, on, my, uh, on my way down, on my way over here uh, yesterday, uh, I found an article from the Nielsen Norman Group. So those of you who are familiar with uh, UX or web usability would be, would be familiar with the Nielsen Norman Group. Uh, they do quite a bit of usability and user experience research. Um, and they have a stat that says you only really need to talk to five users about your product or test your product with five users and you'll get about 95%, you'll catch about 95% of the user experience and usability issues that will crop up uh, in that particular application. Um, so the quote here is, as soon as you collect data from a single test user, your insights shoot up and you have already learned almost a third there is to know about the usability and the design. The difference between zero and even a little bit of data is astounding. Uh, and so this is the graph that they put together. So this is a, uh, this shows the curve of usability problems found versus number of users tested. And so I feel like a lot of times when people go into a user experience test or they're planning some design phase of a project, they can get generally pretty overwhelmed by the, the sort of the user testing portion of that work. Uh, and I think it's because they think they need a really large sample size or they need to talk to as many users as they possibly can. Uh, and the research from these guys basically shows that you could talk to one user uh, and that would be better. Two users, three years users, you get up to five users and you're going to be catching 95% of the, uh, the usability and UX issues um, that could possibly crop up in this particular uh, instance. And that could be pre-planning, uh, you know, maybe you're doing that with wireframes or some sort of analog design or paper prototype all the way through testing an actual iteration. So maybe in your agile workflow, you have some time set aside to test those features against an actual uh, set of users. And if you know you only need to test it with three, four or five users, that becomes a much easier proposition to sell into um, budget offices, managers, whoever's running the project. Um, it, it makes it easy to 
uh, to sell that in. And as an aside, if you are trying to sell in user experience, design services, usability work, the Nielsen Norman Group has a study and data back that can back up basically um, all the reasons you want to take into uh, take into account for that type of work. So I encourage you to check out that group. Um, they have a lot of great uh, a great peer-reviewed research on uh, web usability. So zero users give zero insights. So one user is going to be better than zero always. Uh, and, and like I said before, all the way up to five, obviously if you can do more, that's great, but that, that key number is five, but even one is better than nothing. And those small, tiny, somewhat insignificant amounts of user experience work or usability work that we can do can have a very large impact on the, uh, the greater project as a, as a whole. Uh, this is sort of just uh, um, how we kind of immortalize our user research at Element 84. We do persona cards uh, for almost all the projects that we work on. All the major projects we work on have persona cards. So we go through user testing, we develop the personas, and then we, you know, we print them out. We have design resources on hand that um, build these cards out in, in different ways. We give them names, we give them attributes, and we pass them out to the development team so that they can have a sense of who they're building for while they're uh, while they're working on their project. Uh, these were for our internal website. So. so before we get into the session, I have one shameless session plug for not this session. Uh, this session is the geospatial data analytics and visualization for sustainability in the cloud. I believe it's Thursday. Uh, I think Grega is also speaking at it, and then Dan Pallone, our CTO, he will be there. Uh, he will be talking about a really great example of taking a single user experience interview and turning it into a product concept. Um, and he's going to be talking about um, some disaster response work we did on the Snowball Edge and the user-driven design of, uh, of Headlamp, which is a little mapping interface that we built for that, uh, for that project. So that's my shameless session plug for not this session, but since you're already here, you are in the best session as already, so. Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, we're gonna get started with Mark Reese. Mark is the product owner of Earth Data Search Client uh, on the ESDIS program. He is also a colleague of mine at L184, and he is gonna talk about Earth Data Search UX lessons learned. I think previous moderators got their presentations spun up for their speakers, but we'll let it slide. Come on, here we go. All right, so as Jeff said, I'm Mark, I'm the product owner for Earth Data Search. Um, I've given a lot of talks at, at ESIP and AGU, and I feel like we've we've really dug down into various features of Earth Data Search and um, kind of the, the, the future of Earth Data Search, kind of how we do what we do. Um, so for this particular session, I wanted to talk about lessons learned. Um, I've been on uh, the application for roughly three years now. It's about a five-year-old application. So um, I feel like we, we've got a lot of knowledge um, in this particular space, uh, specifically as we have a kind of a design first approach. Um, so this is just a really quick list of, of the five lessons learned. We're gonna dig down into each one. Um, first is uh, you can't please everyone. Uh, that's probably no surprise to any of you. Um, everyone's got an opinion. Um, they often don't align. I can spot five or six different people in this room that have a different opinion on what we should do with our timeline, for instance. I could go through every single feature of our application and I could name you two or three different opinions, either scrap it all together or this should be the, the main interface that, that we use. This is like, this is the way that we search. Um, so it's, it's very difficult uh, to, to, uh, to per, to present a very cohesive uh, experience. Um, so it's just something you gotta, you gotta work through. Um, and you also have to understand that users are all coming from uh, different places, literally and figuratively. Um, we have people that uh, they prefer to search um, uh, one way, not using a map at all, right? They know specifically which collection or uh, specifically like the individual granular file that they need. We also have people that have never seen any sort of data coming from NASA before and they want to draw a box on a map because they know that they are interested in the Gulf of Mexico, for instance. Uh, so, you, so you really do need to understand your users and where they're coming from, again, literally and, uh, and figuratively, uh, people all over the world using your app. Uh, so our recommendation is to design to the 80%, right? Um, there's, there's no way you're going to catch every single edge case. So let's, let's, let's design to the majority 
Um, and then once you get that right, which is a really important step, you got to get the 80% right first. Then you can start digging into those kind of special, um, I call them snowflake uh, uh, features. Um, use industry standards as much as possible. Um, most people are not going to have a, a, a huge budget for um, uh, intense design processes. So where you can leverage existing patterns. Um, Google does really great work and they make everything available as part of their uh, uh, material design library. Um, I would imagine most of you have at least one Google app on your phone uh, in this room and there's there's like these three little dots and when you see those three little dots you immediately know that that's where their kind of secondary tertiary uh, um, uh, functionality is reuse that right because uh, people are just going to inherently know that uh, and then add multiple paths and options but don't don't overcomplicate things um, again some people like to search uh, specifically with the map some people like just to see the results and, and kind of browse um, pr browse that way Provide both and make it easy to use both uh, where you can. Uh, kind of on, on that same line, uh, golden paths can uh, simplify complexities. Um, workflows are obviously very easy to follow. If you just kind of put all the bits in front of somebody you, you're, and expect them to, to put everything together in the right order, uh, that can be overwhelming um, uh, a lot of times. Uh, for Earth Data Search, we assume kind of a general flow of you search, you browse through the, re the results and you say, oh, this is the, the, the collection that I want or the data set that I want. You can configure that download, whether that's removing certain files or granules or uh, specifically the, over this um, uh, spatial region or just the specific variable that you want. Um, so you configure it your, uh, the way that you want it and then you download. So search, browse, configure, download. We make it very easy to do those things in, in that order. but we also don't force you to do it in that order. Uh, you can you can go back, you can do temporal first and, and then browse and then add some spatial. Uh, w again, we make it easy to go down the golden path, but we also allow you to escape at certain times. So uh, you wanna encourage people to go down kind of the, the, the one true way, um, but again, you wanna provide those multiple um, es escape hatches uh, if needed. Uh, third, uh, UX. This is this is really frustrating for a lot of people, um, spe specifically engineers. Uh, a lot of times we are um, kind of beholden to underlying systems, uh, legacy services. Uh, if those are on the, the inside baseball, there, that's 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 a tough one to swallow. But uh, we have to interact with uh, legacy systems, um, and it's it's never fun, but uh, often required. In the last. Got 12 years, uh, user expectations have dramatically changed with now that we have the computing power of an iPhone like in our pocket. Uh, what users are expecting from applications has shifted dramatically. Um, we, we still support the uh, uh, ordering data and delivering it on, on a DVD, for instance. Like, I don't think that people, like I don't even have a DVD player in my home. I, I don't know why we're offering that for this cutting edge data, right? So, uh, so we have to understand that, uh, especially as our, our uh, user base gets younger, like my kids won't even know what a DVD is, right? Um, so as technology shifts, user expectations are going to shift and we have to be able to, to keep up with that while still obviously supporting legacy systems because they're very expensive to, uh, to, to rewrite. So, uh, so we wanna move as much as we can towards modern systems and then where we do have to depend on um, uh, on those, those those legacy systems, we want to decouple those live actions as much as possible. And I'll touch on that um, just uh, on my closing slide as well. Uh, screen real estate is very expensive, especially with these um, uh, very complicated applications. They're very powerful. Um, there's lots of data. Uh, exposing all of the data and metadata just flat out does not work. Um, uh, I think Tyler's going to talk a little bit about uh, UMMVAR and various UMM uh, metadata uh, standards. Um, it is, it's overwhelming. The, one of the top two or three feedback points that we get every time that we've done uh, usability studies, is like this is overwhelming. There's just too much for me to sift through. Um, so it, it's just, it's not realistic to be able to, uh, to expose everything. Um, users can, be, uh, can become paralyzed with too many options to choose from. Uh, and we also have these kind of very um, tight constrained panels 
Um, those just don't work. Uh, some people want to be able to, to drag them, uh, drag it open so where they can kind of read everything. Um, a lot of times the, the name, just the names for the, these data sets just don't fit into a screen real estate of, of a, a, like a MacBook Air. Uh, so we get feedback all the time that make it bigger. We need more text. Um, so yeah, you want to understand specifically which pieces of information your users need at the specific step within your application that, that they are at. So understand what you need, what your users need and when. Uh, and then to Jeff's point here uh, about uh, user testing, nothing beats live testing. Um, no design ever survives uh, first contact with the user. Um, the spectrum of understand of understanding always amazes me. Um, there, you'll you'll sit someone down and they've never used your application. They they're just able to blow through it, and that's always makes me very happy. But then you'll have someone that's been a, a career scientist, and maybe they've they've had their whole career down one specific application or use case. You sit them in front of your app, and it's like they're they're paralyzed. And like, what does this big green button do? Um, so it's 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 always interesting to watch someone um, um, uh, use your app. Uh, I did a little experiment and I, I put my wife in front of the app and she's like, what? She's not, she's not in this space at all. Um, and she looked at me like I had three heads. It's like, we have some work to do, obviously. Um, and then product teams, if you're only running your designs past the people on your team, uh, you can be susceptible to confirmation bias. So I, I, I go in with a certain set of assumptions and then whenever I see a design that reaffirms that, it's like, yeah, that's the best design I've ever seen, which Again, we're not considering the, the entire user base, uh, so you need to be aware of that. Uh, so you want to find opportunities to put your application in front of someone specifically who has never used your application before. Um, I, th I find that's where you get the, the most insights. So how we have applied those lessons specifically to Earth Data Search, um, so we've spun up a, a governance group to discuss uh, to discuss the various features that and, and, and priorities, and then a product team uh, makes the final decision. So uh, everyone has an opinion, right? So we have a, a governance board that talks about, um, uh, that takes those opinions and we prioritize them. Uh, and then we have a product team that, that decides on how we're going to act on those as the final decision. Uh, the end-to-end -end services has brought that, that workflow, has made that workflow a lot, a lot easier where you can go back and forth and it brings the, the discovery and the, the customizations of that data um, closer together. Uh, we are actively moving um, information out of this. We had a very specific uh, set of requests to legacy services. Uh, in some cases, we'll take 10, 13, 15 seconds just to get a very simple response back. And those were live calls. So a user would click a button and they would wait sometimes 15 seconds for a response. No one in this room would wait 15 seconds to, to load a, a web page. You would bail really quickly. Um, so as we're, we're rewriting the application, which is awesome. Uh, and we're we're decoupling a lot of those live calls to legacy services. So uh, we just demoed this uh, a couple of weeks ago. What a, a call that used to take 15 seconds to respond, there's a page that loads instantly now because we're doing all of this these calls in the, in the background and updating it uh, without the user having to do that, which is really great. Um, and then uh, and then in the future, kind of forward forward looking, uh, we did a, a fairly big redesign of our uh, collection search, um, what, a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Um, and I think it's okay to admit that you were wrong. So hopefully very soon we'll, we'll be moving back to a, a vertical um, base, uh, base layout, but then of course applying some lessons that we've learned uh, in, in usability testing since then. And I think that's all I've got. I think we're holding, got to show the dog because he's awesome. Uh, and we're going to hold questions until the end, I think. So, thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, next up, uh, we have Greg Milchinski. He is the co-founder and CEO of Synergize, and he's going to be up here talking about Sentinel Hub apps and designing UI on the EO API. <clears throat> so, um... So yeah, we, we basically started to write uh, the applications, not for the users, but really just to demonstrate our services. Because what we have is we have developed this nice uh, and the best service out there for processing satellite data, which is a web service. So pretty boring in terms of a um, application and user interface. And it's as boring as that. You just have an API and you say, I want this and that at that point in time. And you get the data right in any kind of form. And that's uh, not the most uh, beautiful thing out there. 
and uh, but we wanted to to basically create a demo applications for our potential users so that they would see what they can do with the services and uh, so these are kind of the, the things that we wanted to demonstrate first that um, you can actually have the whole world of the data available immediately uh, because we don't pre-process anything and there is no ordering and things like that that you can do some uh, custom processing script and that it's fast like that it takes like one second to get the data and uh, also because it's uh, pretty cheap to operate these things that you can do this at scale now this is the competition that we had um, like three years ago when we started with Sentinel Hub. It's a famous uh, uh, Copernicus, um, how, how it's called, operational hub or whatever. And it's uh, not uh, too much of a competition because everyone hates it. Um, and so this is this is what we wanted to beat, right? And it's, I mean, here, if you want to get from, uh, if you actually want to get some data, it will take you literally minutes or hours because you need to download everything and process it. And we wanted to show that this can be done faster. So this was <clears throat> our first try. So that was three years ago, right? So it's, the thing is evolving further. Uh, it was called Postcard, <clears throat> Postcard from Space. And it was, it was when we first developed a service where you can call uh, the API and get some image out of it. But that service was, was pretty slow. Like it took five, six, seven seconds. And it was simply not scalable enough to support the interactive use. So we said, okay, let's do something that this will not be as obvious. And uh, um, basically, we, we made this application where you were, were you able to go to the area that you're interested in, set the time parameter, what you'd like to see, poof, and you got it. And it looked fast because it was pretty limited. And then we said, okay, so now <clears throat> let's do the, the proper application. This one, this one actually for our uh, real users who will be able to um, look at the data that they will want to get, look different visualizations, and then download it, right? And they will pay for it. And that was our idea. We didn't ask any user before that, because obviously we are smart enough. And uh, um, we didn't ask many users after that, because nobody was using that application, um, because people are not really keen of paying for things that they can do themselves, right? Anyway, so this was, uh, uh, again, the start, and then, then we, at some point, actually, we managed to create an API which was fast enough. And then we uh, said, okay, let's do the Sentinel Playground as the next demo application. And these were uh, kind of our objectives. First one is that to simply show that we can do it, and something that even Google was not doing at the time, uh, to show the full air hive of Sentinel data. And then also what we notice is that most of the people have no idea what Sentinel data are um, and why they are good for. Uh, why they are maybe <clears throat> better than Google Maps in some in, in some aspects, uh, and we wanted to kind of increase this awareness. Now we wanted to make it super simple uh, because it was meant for really anyone, right? Anyone who is familiar with Google Maps, for example. Now we and then we wanted to demonstrate this multi-temporal, multi-spectral nature of Sentinel, um, which is not really easy and simple, right? So it was kind of a um, constraint uh, opposing the first one. And then we wanted that some advanced users could be able to test it uh, in a more advanced manner. And we wanted that it really is usable across the globe, so not just in uh, specific parts of the world. So this is what we came up with. So that's a, 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 a typical workflow. You go to an area of interest and you immediately see the, uh, the, the image and then you can look through different lenses. And where it gets really powerful is when you click that calendar and you see all these other uh, um, acquisitions in that area only in that area and you can simply click on one and you get another image. And that, that's something that users really liked. And here you can see on the calendar that you have differently colored uh, spots and this is based on the how, how cloudy this, uh, these are so that you can go to the ones that will probably be good. Now, in terms of the uh, design decisions that we made, first one uh, is where the application initially loads. When you go to Sentinel Playground, which area do you see? I mean, the most obvious thing would be to look at the IP and simply show where the user is located. But unfortunately, um, Sentinel data are pretty cloudy. So there would be a large chance that when the, the first thing that user sees is a cloud, lots of clouds and people don't like clouds, so they would simply go away. So we chose in Madrid uh, because it's uh, not so cloudy city. It's a capital, it's in Europe, you know, Sentinel and Europe and so on. Um, and so really there is a large chance that people will see the not cloudy image. 
then this cloudiness is something that we prioritize pretty uh, um, significantly that you even don't see the last image uh, you see so here we see the images from 11th and 8th of July even though there is a 13th of July image available but that's cloudy so we hide this unless the user chooses the, 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 to, to look at the cl more cloudy data and we simply uh, show the something that looks nice because we wanted the users to really stay there and explore further. Now then, <clears throat> another thing that we did is that we wanted to get rid of these scenes. So uh, all the satellite data now are being taken uh, by some scenes or granules or whatever you call them. And then most of the applications show these scenes, but people really don't care about them. People want to just see the data at their area. So we said, we'll simply show everything, we'll combine, we'll stitch the data so that uh, um, users will see the full screen. One other thing that you see, by the way, this is a um, land viewer from EOS, so the, um, I'm comparing to them because it's probably most similar to what we have. Uh, the, the next thing that you see is that uh, our image looks pretty dull compared to like ni a nice colorful image in land viewer. And that's uh, a reason for that is that we wanted to make it consistent and you cannot really make a color correction that works across the globe which is obviously the same area and the same scene, the same date, just a bit different colors and it looks horrible, right? In our case, it's always dull, but it's at least it's consistent, right? So you can zoom out and you see across the globe, you have a similar, similar colors. And then if you want to play with it, yeah, there is a switch and you can turn it on and you can even play with gain and gamma and things like that, but most people don't go there because they are more interested in information than uh, in, in a beautiful image. Now, where it gets uh, interesting is when you start playing with this data. So, um, on the left side, you see this uh, typical uh, um, visualization options that we chosen from the ones that we found that people would be interested in and that they are colorful and nice and so on. But then where it gets interesting is where people start combining the, the bands so that they actually start to, to explore this multispectral aspect. Um, and so that's something that this uh, this middle thing is something that uh, I guess we we defined and we didn't see it elsewhere. But then we've seen it afterwards in many other applications. So I guess that was the right decision. But where it gets really cool is on this uh, the right side when the people start uh, typing in their own algorithms. This is something that um, we supported and it's not uh, the most beautiful one, but it's powerful, right? You just turn on a switch and then you start typing in JavaScript. And this got really popular and people started to, to, to create nice scripts. So we decided to create a GitHub repository of all these different kinds of scripts uh, that people can contribute. We put in a lot of, uh, that we found on the internet. And then you can uh, find the scripts and you can simply copy paste it into the uh, Sentinel playground, uh, or you can even just use the URL and you, you have the script running. And now you can start exploring further, tweaking the script a bit and I mean, this, this is Pierre Marcus wildfire script, which is used by quite significantly, not just in our, uh, but also it was translated in Google Earth Engine and stuff like this. And it's a simple thing. And this guy is not a remote sensing expert. He's just some guy who like to work with the, the colors and images. Uh, another thing that we did is that we didn't want to, um, uh, to, to create like a, a, a tool that you will say, I would outline this and I would only want to export this part because it would be just another button and we wanted to avoid that. So if you want to um, export this image, but you don't want the full screen, what you do is just shape up the, the browser window to uh, uh, what you uh, what you'd like to export, and then you click export and you have it, right? And that's um, not too intuitive, uh, and many people don't see it, but then when they realize it, then it's, it's easy to use. And I mean, again, we avoid one button, which would confuse people. Now, uh, Sentinel Playground was, uh, and is quite a success, uh, so these are, the number of requests that we process per, per month. And you see that it grew from like uh, 10 million to close to 50 million or 40 million and so per month. So, I mean, people are really using this a lot and, and we see that they are using it from all different uh, backgrounds and, and, and places and so. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, we were really proud when people started doing some advanced things with it. So people who are the experts and who for Sentinel Playground was not built for them, but they still found some value in it and they, they, they played around and then they share these things. So then the next step in, uh, uh, in our portfolio was the EO browser, um, which was supposed to, uh, which was meant to be the multi-mission. So not just Sentinel-2, but uh, all the other data sources. It was supposed to be a bit more advanced, but not like too complicated. So still for anyone. And uh, um, it needed to be generic. 
uh, and then uh, we wanted that this really serves as a showcase of what kind of applications you can build on top of the Sentinel Hub. So this is uh, what we built. Uh, you can see that this doesn't start over Madrid, but over Rome. Um, Rome is also a pretty cloudless city. Uh, and importantly, uh, the EO browser started with a small grant from ESA, and they are located near Rome. So we said, okay, so here it is. You have something uh, um, for you. But then, so then what you do, uh, what the user do, they simply select, uh, the, this is more like a typical uh, browser, right? Or typical searcher for the scenes. And we even have these scenes in there, uh, even though we hate this. But the reason is that uh, the ESA wanted to, to use this EO browser also as a search for actually downloading the data from the, the, the hubs, um, which I think most people don't do, but still. But anyway, as soon as you click visualize, you again get the full uh, orbit. You don't see the scene anymore. We hide this. Uh, you see the, basically it's not just the orbit, you see the, the whole day of data. So this is the difference which we made in Sentinel Playground. We create a mosaic of, so that we fill the full screen and we combine data from different dates simply to have the screen filled. This one, we said, okay, we will limit it only to one date so that the people really look what they're looking at, uh, into so that they know what kind of data they are. So this is, I mean, you, you set per day and you, 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 you see it. Now, if they want to play with uh, more additional things like, uh, they, like color corrections, they can choose different kind of, uh, the, we call them atmospheric correction or color collection, co correction things. They can even uh, play with the different bands, uh, um, RGB values and, and thresholding and so on, or they can simply look into the properly atmospherically corrected data. Um, then what we did is that uh, we put in some layers that uh, like scene classification, then people started asking uh, what do actually these colors mean? And then we said, okay, we need a legend, right? Uh, and that a legend is something that's quite challenging uh, in this kind of application because it's not easy to do one. I mean, scene classification, it's easy, but NDVI, what do you put the legend zero to one or moisture index zero to something, something? So that's still something that we haven't solved uh, and people are asking us about what these things mean but we don't know, right? Because we just uh, put the, the, the data there and it would be nice if someone here in the room would come up with nice explanations of what things mean in the remote sensing uh, uh, products. The time-lapse, that was a quite a nice uh, uh, thing that we did. Um, basically, uh, again, we limit it to a, an, an area, not the full screen and that's for the performance because here the uh, you, you, people, uh, people usually get 100 uh, images and this this would uh, be quite a load to the service but what we did is that we calculate the cloud coverage for each and every scene uh, per scene uh, sorry per area of uh, interest and then users can simply filter by that and uh, and then they get like less cloudy data and then they simply uh, um, turn on the ones that they want and then export it as a time lapse or another one is a, a statistical analysis where you simply digitize what you would like to analyze and then you click a statistical analysis and you get like NDVI, things like that. Again, this is difficult because people would want to do this with the true color as well, but there, I mean, not much to see there, right? We did the cloud, uh, cloud correction here as well so that you can filter by that. And then last is the compare functionality. That was uh, um, so that people could actually look in how things are changing through time or how actually the, the different spectrums uh, show. And I mean, people can simply put in all the, the, the data that they would like in this pin step, and then they, they use compare and then look into it. In terms of configurability, everything is super simple. Uh, so everything is based on the OGC APIs and we have uh, the configuration for each of the data sources. And within the, that configuration, we have all the layers and you can simply go and uh, um, update these layers, add new ones, and, and you have new data sets or new layers in the application. And we wanted to make it um, make it as a showcase, and this is why we put it on a GitHub as an open source, so anyone can use it. And people do come and use it, and they deploy their own versions and they do whatever they want with it. Um, now there are still things that we haven't solved. The typical one is people looking into this kind of image and saying, "Oh, that's so bad. Google Google Maps is much better, right? Uh, and because it has so much better resolution." And then uh, the other another thing they say, "Ah." Here we have a scale of 100 meters. Can we look into 10 meters because Sentinel-2 is 10 meters and they expect to get actually 10 times better image, even though this is just a graphical scale, right? So it's really challenging how to present to people that this resolution is basically uh, the best that they can get. 
um, and that it's still useful. And this is for the like the the uh, beginners, but even for advanced uh, or advanced, let's say more advanced users, they want to export the data in 10 meters. And it's not really trivial to export the data in 10 meters if you're using the the uh, Latlon projection, right? And people don't understand that they will maybe get an approximation of 10 meters um, because they they simply expect that it's super simple and nobody's thinking about uh, this deep. Anyway, EO browser is as well um, quite heavily used, a bit less than playground because it's more advanced. Um, you can see nice peaks that result in a like one forum post which gathered 30,000 views, but then people looked into it and said, ah, Google Maps is much better and simply went away. Um, but there, there are many people who simply use it further and do more advanced stuff with it. Um, like, uh, um, yeah, they, they do time lapses and they do time lapses of all different kind of things uh, and, and they share it. And it's really interesting from us, from our point to look into how people are using the app. Uh, they do some advanced stuff as well, like these guys, they, they, they uh, use it as an open source intelligence, as they call it, and they uh, track things like military and uh, environmental disasters. Uh, then this guy uh, did a, a flood detection uh, using just EO browser, and he was like published on the BBC, or here is the wildfire thing. Again, I mean, people can do really uh, interesting stuff with it, and because it's so easy, they actually do it, right? Anyway, I'll end here and thank you very much. All right. Uh, so next up we have Amy Barchowska. She is from DevSeed and she's going to be talking about uh, dynamic tiling or how dynamic tiling meets OGC standards. How do you hit? Can you start the? Just wondering how to open it. There. There we go. Hello. Um, yes, my name is Amy. I'm going to be talking about collaborating on data and algorithms, uh, providing a good user experience for users of the multi-mission algorithm analysis platform. And um, what Jeff mentioned, one of the specific ways that we're doing this is marrying a new type of technology, dynamic tiling, uh, with an existing OGC standard um, for map tiling. So first, my name is Amy Barchowskis. By way of introduction, I'm a data engineer at Development Seed. Um, and I'm working on the map project with a lot of other really smart people. And I wanted to mention uh, those groups today because a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about is open source projects that they that people at uh, JPL and the impact group at Marshall Space Flight Center have been working on. Uh, the MAP is a collaboration between NASA and the European Space Agency and within NASA the two groups that are um, contributing to this project are the impact group that's out of Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama and the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. So what is the MAP? The MAP brings together critical SAR and satellite airborne and field and LIDAR data from multiple missions for biomass estimation. So it's bringing together um, data from these upcoming missions and the JEDI mission. Um, all these missions are really interesting in their own way, own right and bringing new types of data. Uh, I just wanted to play this cool video that is on the JETA web website from UMD, which basically shows how LIDAR works. So this is a video showing the JETA instrument, which is already in orbit. And basically LIDAR data is um, being collected by beaming these, laser, uh, these lasers down to the Earth's surface. And those lasers are basically being shot down on, on the forest floor. And the time um, that it takes to get a response from those uh, those laser signals is basically enabling us to capture a 3D representation of the canopy structure of the forest and it returns these LIDAR waveforms. So uh, what is the map? So the map is a science virtual environment dedicated to the unique needs of sharing and processing data from relevant field, airborne, and satellite measurements related to both ESA and NASA missions. So it's jointly ma managed by ESA and NASA and accessible to uh, designated scientists. 
and it's initially populated with pre-launch and complementary data from other projects. Um, it's also going to enable users to add their own data. Uh, science focuses to improve the understanding of global terrestrial carbon dynamics and to support algorithm de de development. So it's one of the it's it, it's a platform basically to um, drive open science, and it addresses a need exp expressed by the science community to more easily share and process data collected by both um, NASA and ESA activities. So why do we need the map? Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar in the room, um, NASA's Earth observation data is going to have an exponential increase in volume in the next couple of years. Um, this is just one of many um, sort of impressive plots showing the SWAT and NISAR missions. Uh, you know, NASA between NASA's Earth observation division between um, 2017 and 2022 is going to be uh, growing its archival volume by about 10 times um, between just in those five years. So we need, we need platforms like the map to store and co-locate large data volumes produced by new satellite missions being launched. We need to provide access to compute resources for global and temporal scale analysis. And the scientific community needs improved data and algorithm sharing, um, and algorithm sharing and collaboration across users and organizations. So what can users do on the map platform? They can search across multi-sensor multi missions they can visually explore this data. They can run processing like subsetting and uh, generating zonal, zonal statistics. And they can also do things like biomass product validation using in situ data, which can be user provided or provided on the platform. Uh, and they can also develop, they can develop algorithms, right? They can, they can write new algorithms, they can share, they can iterate. So in order to make these types of uh, interfaces possible for the users, search, visually explore, and process. In order to do this across agencies, we use standards. So as I mentioned, the map is a collaboration between ESA and NASA, and both, um, both of those agencies are providing data and computing resources. However, we want to provide joint access to data and algorithms. So one of the reasons why these algorithms are going to be, you know, are, are going to be more accurate or better in, in theory is because we're going to be able to use data from both ESA and NASA and because both um, you know people researchers affiliated with NASA and re researchers affiliated with ESA are going to be able to collaborate on algorithms on this platform. So standards support interoperability that's our our favorite work word on the map project it's interoperability and ESA and NASA can agree on standards so that we can share data and algorithms each ad agency is building tools and services on top of these standards. So this is how I like to visually explain this concept. Basically, um, we have these abstract idea of user interfaces, how people are gonna interact or, or what types of actions people are gonna be able to take on this platform. And then we have standards which support uh, both uh, agencies supporting these interfaces. We're using the unified metadata models um, that NASA's generated that NASA has developed, we're also using standards of the OGC. Um, so the web, specifically right now, the web map and web map tile services um, for visually exploring the data and the web processing service uh, standard for processing data. And um, those standards are just the ones that we have been developing right now. We, as we continue to develop the new features of the platform, we are always looking to existing um, standards so that we can basically have interoperability with ESA having the same types of actions with our data and our algorithms. So um, within NASA, we're developing a platform, we're developing a platform of tools and services built on top of these standards. So um, for, for search, we have the Earth Data Search Client, um, uh, which Mark already talked about, and the Common Metadata Repository, that's a search API of all of the data that's available um, within the NASA map platform or within the, uh, within the NASA operational platform. We also have, um, for visually exploring the data, we're using a um, uh, open source tool developed out of JPL called the Common Mapping Client, and I'll show you guys what that looks like in a couple of slides, as well as a dynamic tiling API. And then for processing, uh, we're using another open source software called um, Hide SDS, developed out of JPL. That stands for Hybrid Science Data um, Hybrid Science Data System. 
so as I mentioned before, this is basically to demonstrate that NASA and ESA both have their own set of um, tools and services that they're de developing on top of these standards. And then we have a map API, which is enabling um, access, enabling both, both agencies to access each other's data using the same type of APIs. Oh, and then just to mention that both, both um, ESA and NASA are using a tool called Eclipse Che, um, which is basically an uh, integrated development environment. So it's one of these tools that you can basically um, deploy, you know, you can deploy your own version of Eclipse Che and it enables you to use one or develop your own stack of basic, which is basically like a Docker image of operating, um, operating system and software. And you can build a workspace and then it also enables users to share and collaborate on workspaces. So, um, you know, I as Amy can go in and create my own workspace, but then George Chang, who's another developer on the map platform can create a workspace and I can open up that workspace and, and iterate from there. So that's basically our, our basic algorithm or integrated development environment. That's where we expect a lot of our users, a lot of our science users to do their work. So how do we make search across agencies possible? So as I mentioned, we're using NASA's open source search tools, the Common Metadata Repository and the Earth Data Search Client to enable users to discover data from both ESA and NASA. So we built tools which interface with these standards support integrated search via the algorithm development environment. So just a little bit of background um, in case you're not familiar with the um, UMM uh, unified metadata model. So UMM defines basically, um, you know, an XML standard for representing um, different concepts. They call concepts being collections or granules. Uh, there's also going to be, you know, variables, um, which are going to be talked about here in a second, and services. So different types of concepts within the sort of field of geospatial data that you might want to search. That's what's being represented by the unified metadata model standards. And then we're also using a uh, common metadata repository, which is basically an HTTP API into these, into these data models. And then Earth Data Search Client, which I have a screenshot of here, um, to basically for, to enable a user interface into those collections and, and granules. So that's a little bit of background just on the, um, on the backing infrastructure of our search. So within the map platform, um, you know, we, we have our, our both ESA and NASA data represented using the unified metadata model and the CMR API. That is being wrapped in the map API, which um, enable, and then we have our own instance of the Earth Data Search Client, which is available in a, the Eclipse J interface. So the innovation here is basically that we have used um, this idea of Jupyter Lab. Uh, a JupyterLab plugins to enable Earth Data Search Client to be embedded into our algorithm development environment. So this is the Eclipse J interface that somebody's already logged into, and they're basically able to um, go into the Earth Data Search Client, search the map data sets, and then the sort of second innovation here is basically being able to copy those queries. So I'm just going to go back again and play that. So, because it went kind of quickly, but basically the user is able to um, load up the Earth Data Search client here, make a selection, uh, a collection and a bounding box selection like they would normally be able to. So this is a familiar interface to them. And then they're able to go back into their Jupyter notebook and um, paste that search query and get those results. And then from there, are able to develop using those files or that data directly. Uh, so how do we make visualization across agencies possible? So we're using the OGC standards, um, the web map service and the web map tile service to provide interfaces to visualize later layers of data from both ESA and NASA. So we built the dynamic tiling API and the common mapping client and reused tools such as the common mapping client to visualize both NASA and ESA data. So again, WMTS is a XML standard and we're using a dynamic tiling API. So that's cloud. So basically the dynamic tiling um, API is built on top of cloud optimized geotiffs. So the innovation here is basically that you are able to um, generate PNGs or JPEGs on the fly, depending on you know, the type of request you're making and not storing those all statically, just backed by the cloud optimized geotiffs. And we're, um, that, that API is backing our map API, which is 
representing those, um, those capabilities via WMTS standards. And then we are representing those layers in the Eclipse Che, which has embedded in it the common mapping client. So this is just a screenshot of how this works. So you can see here we have a Jupyter Notebook um, and a, a, a library we've developed called PyCMC. So once you call PyMC, CMC, map CMC, you get the common mapping client inside your Jupyter Notebook and you can map layers that are representing data, you know, critical data sets to that science community. So this is um, UAVSAR data and ELVIS data, um, you know, map, mapped using the common mapping client. So those are two collections that we have um, for our map platform. Uh, processing, so how do we make processing across agencies possible? Well, there's also a standard for this. So there's, it's called the web processing service. Um, so this provides an interface to process data. And so the map uses HiSDS um, to process data using the WPS standard. Uh, again, WPS XML standard, this is an execute request. So um, similar type of diagram, basically we have the HiSDS API, which is um, basically backed by a Kubernetes cluster for processing data. Uh, we have the WPS rep responses um, being uh, embedded in the map API. And then we have an interface into processing data in the Eclipse Che. So um, here's a video basically where a user is going to um, use the Eclipse Che interface to run an algorithm on map data. So they're able to describe an algorithm that they've discovered. So they've discovered an algorithm. They're gonna use this to describe. This describe box is basically telling the user what are the inputs that this algorithm requires. And then once they figure out what inputs are required, they're actually able to submit a request to execute that job. Um, they're passing here, they're passing some parameters to that job. Once they click OK, they're gonna get back a job ID. That job ID, um, they're copying into a get job status um, request and it's a, you know, you get the response of the job is started. So challenges and opportunities. So one of the challenges is that these OGC responses, these standards are in XML. There aren't a huge number of libraries to help build an API to meet these OGC specs. Um, so this has basically made it, uh, made it sort of, you know, a, a double step from developing clients on top of these OGC specs to generate the type of responses that we, we need for those clients. Um, another thing that's come up is how do we integrate CMR and OGC standards? So given that these collections and Given that we're providing interfaces into these collections and granules um, for, for visualization and for processing, we want to enable those, we want to enable users and clients to be able to discover those, those capabilities, right? So we, if somebody's searching for a collection, we want to let them know like, hey, there is this endpoint where you can actually visualize this collection or you can process this collection. So um, developing a new, a new way, we're thinking about new ways of basically integrating CMR or the metadata for a collection or granule with these OGC standards. So to let people know with everything that's possible for the data that exists in this platform. Um, many and most tools don't use these standards. For example, Plast.io, this is a really cool tool which basically creates 3D, um, 3D renderings of LiDAR data. And you can just up upload any LAS file and it will, it will generate those representations for you. Um, but there's a big opportunity here too, because we can contribute back what we have learned about using these standards to make them more extensible. So key takeaways. Um, the map is a new paradigm for open science platforms, given the collaboration between ESA and NASA. These agencies are agreeing on standards so they can use each other's data and algorithms. And we're building tools on top of these standards to create the user experience required for our science users. Thanks. All right, thank you, Amy. All right, so next up, uh, our final talk is gonna be from Tyler Stevens. Uh, he's a senior discipline engineer on the NASA EED2 program, uh, and he's gonna be talking about evolving UMM VAR uh, to improve how users can access NASA as this data sets or ES data sets.
ますかね。Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody. Um, yes, as I was, I was just mentioned, I'm with the um, the CMR Med Data Quality Team on the ED project, and myself and um, my colleague Simon Contrell, um, we work to develop the UMM bar, the variable med data model within the um, within the common med data repository. So I'm going to kind of talk about how we basically use the the med data models to help drive um, kind of like the back end in terms of how you go about search and discover metadata. And, and the data and find information about it and, and the information within the metadata and how that's um, one thing we did uh, recently with the E2E was end to end services and kind of how that whole user experience works. Um, so I want to give a brief introduction to the UMM VAR for anyone who's not familiar with that metadata model. Then go into the E2E capability and how um, that works from beginning to end from user doing a search to actually um, doing something with the, the data within a um, client. Um, um, and I'll try to do a little bit of a demo of that also at the end. So for, for anyone who's, who's not familiar with the common med metadata repository, as well as the, um, the UMMM, uh, the UMMM metadata models, we have models for collections, services, um, variables, and this is uh, for the variables, this model describes kind of like the end-to-end -end, um, description of the variable level metadata and provides, you know, more specific information about um, the collection um, and allows for the certain discovery of that. So, so one thing is that within the variable, you're describing the measurement, which is this observable property um, in terms of what the actual object and quantity is of the um, the data set from the that comes from the, the data, and the, and this variable is like like some examples shown here, uh, land surface airflow. That specific measurement that's being described within the variable, and that's and the variable itself is that geophysical quantity associated with that particular data product, and you could have um, one or more variables within a specific um, collection uh, tied to a specific collection record. Um, so the the fields within the UMVAR that are um, shown here, you see you have the um, information about the, the variable and you have all the variable characteristics, the dimensions, size, uh, the measurement identifiers, which are the particular uh, uh, information describing the object and quantity of those variables, uh, science keywords and um, sets and uh, other things. And you can go onto the um, Earth Data website and actually download the the model and the, the model description to get all the information about those fields. Um, right. Okay. So in terms of wh where we're at with the current model implementation right now, we're in version. 1.5, we updated several things related to size estimation and also um, a lot of work and feedback from uh, JESDIS to the Goddard Earth Science um, Information Center. There's a lot of uh, work that we did with them in terms of this Pathfinder to actually, um, you know, improve, both improve the model and both improve that user experience from, from the point of actually um, you know, uh, it, it, other information like the variable uniqueness and um, uh, the acquisition source name, the things that we've added to that model in this particular version. Um, uh, and another thing too to mention is how these records are curated. Uh, so we have uh, what we call UVG script that can auto generate that um, actually auto generate the variable metadata based on the um, um, documentation already at the different um, EOS SIS data centers. Um, the records can also be curated manually using the, uh, the the metadata management tool. That's basically just a curation tool where you can go in field by field and, and edit those uh, UMVAR records. Um, you can also curate them using the CMR API um, based on the, the schema 
that we have. People can generate, VAX can generate those VAR records. And then um, they could all, they also be associated to a collection record. So as I mentioned, you can have multiple VARs records for a given collection. So you can go in and do your association um, for multiple VAR records to one particular collection record. Um, and as I mentioned, all this documentation for the model and is also um, up online on the Earth Data Wiki page. And just, just one thing I mentioned about the, the evolution of the model. Um, we actually developed the model, but the model is, is driven by the user community. We have at the NASA as the standards office facilitates the reviews, usually yearly or, or bi-yearly reviews of these models. And they go through a very vigorous um, period. People get to review the model, make suggestions for improvements. And over time, that model evolves. And that was just uh, the most recent one was the what we did about a year and a half ago, which resulted in version 1.5 of, of the MMVAR. Um, so I want to talk a little about the end-to-end -end capability that we did um, this past year. So this end-to-end -end service capability, this enables users to apply data transformation to data sets at the variable level. So this requires both the UMS, which is the um, Unified Metadata Model for Services, which describes the backend services, APIs, including several of the OGC services that Amy um, mentioned, um, as well as you also need to have the variable record to be the present, to be in the CMR, and and have that uh, help um, to help drive everything, and then you should do a, a minute association between those records with the collection record, and then there's a specific field, specific section within the um, UMS, the services model, uh, the service options class, and this provides a way to uh, identify the data transformation options, and I'll show that within the demo. So when the user goes in, does a search, and they get to the granule and they want to get um, that set of information and basically what's available in terms of what format, what transformation, um, what, what projection you want it in. Um, that's all driven by the metadata models. So these models all work together to help drive that user experience when the user goes in and uses Earth Data Search. And um, so basically, you know, the end, the end thing here is that this end-to-end -end services goes beyond your traditional order and download paradigm and offers a better way or more enhanced way to um, for users to retrieve the data that they're looking for. Um, so for a provider, what does a provider need to do to add these capabilities to their records? Um, we, we have a, one line also a, a full uh, a user guide, a curator's guide for this as well. I just kind of want to give you the snapshot right here of this. So um, you have to have your records, you have to have your um, UMS records in the CMR. Um, as I mentioned, you can curate them with the MMT or the CMR API. You have to have the services options, um, information filled out, whether you have an open DAP thread, WMS. Um, you, you have to do the service collection association to, to link that information together within the models. And then you also need to um, provide the UMVAR record. Like I said, you can generate this automatically using the UVG scripts. You can also uh, provide that manually um, using the CMR API or the metadata management tool. And then and then uh, those be associated too. And we have, like I said, we have all the documentation available online for how to, um, if you have specific collections with new services, new collections, um, and how to configure everything. And as I mentioned, the actual um, curator's guide. Um, for, for users who want to know all that about um, w what to do to enable this in an Earth Data Search. So I want to walk through this just a little bit, and then I'll actually just kind of do a live um, search in, in Earth Data Search. So users go to the Earth Data Search, and they search for a collection. One thing they'll notice is this customizable badge, and this, and this basically uh, tells the user that this data set can be customizable um, from the spatial uh, reformat and temporal subset in they're all different options that are available for this particular um, collection that's that's in the earth data search um, so from there um, sorry let me go back here so from here a user would um, select that record and then they uh, would, would put that within their 
project page. And this is where you can customize your options. So you can customize in terms of the data access method. If you want a, a very particular, the specific variable, as, as I mentioned earlier, you, you have multiple variables that are tied to one collections. So in this case, um, looking at the left-hand side of the screen, you would be able to select your particular variable of interest for that collection. But then once you uh, go in and, and do all that on the right-hand side, then you then would take that and then you could put that into your into your download. So you're only downloading just the information that you want, the, the, the data that you want. Um, so I'm gonna show this real time. And I'm not a Mac guy, so how do I get back to the browser real quick? Where'd it go? Oh, okay, it just it's hot, it's hidden. <laughs> uh, it was in um, keep my slides handy because I'm gonna go back to. I think it was yeah, the Chrome, right? Did we lose it's it? Gotten close, yeah. I can, okay, I can open back up. Thanks. Um, Sorry, I had this. Oh. Okay, sorry about that. We had open and somehow it got closed. Um, so, so this uh, this is the Earth Data Search client as uh, we talked about in several of our talks, and this is the. Uh, all the all the US disk collection records are available through this and uh, what you see here are basically the the records that are that are described in the collections and and the models help drive this so um, I'm interested in soil moisture so I do a search for soil moisture so I'm interested in this map collection right here so you can see this is the customizable badge I'm talking about Support spatial and parameter customizations, uh, spatial customizations, variable customizations, data transformation options. Um, they're all available for this particular collection. If I want to just find some more information about this collection, this takes me to like a high level uh, landing page about this collection. If I want to just see more information about this collection, it takes me to a more detailed page that shows. The, um, you know, the abstract, the uh, DOI, uh, processing level, um, access URLs to that particular collection. So what I want to do here is, um, let me go back here. So I, I, for this particular collection, I want to go over here. So if you hit the little plus here, it basically, this basically adds that, add the collection to your current project. So if I go over here, up here to my project, um, that collection is available. I don't know, this is what I did before. Um, you need to log into Earth Data to um, to actually go in and, and do the, the the customization options and download the data. So I'm logging in with my Earth Data login, and then this is going to take me to the the project page. Where I can see my collection and and based on the information in the collection and also the information that was within the VAR records and the services record and that's all tied together as I mentioned because you can do the associations between those that helps basically drive this user experience uh, with uh, within with an earth data search uh, that along with all the all the, all the information that was applied there in the end to end uh, services so so here I can, so there's several things I can do, right? So I can directly download the data, stay for delivery, but what I'm really interested in is this customization part right here. So I can go in here and do um, ticker, this is the, basically the different output formats that are available for this data set. So if I wanted in that CDF, ASCII, KML, GeoTIFF, I can choose that. Um, in this particular case, I just wanna keep it as HDF. And um, if I want to do additional subsetting, I can um, go in and add, um, enter the bounding box. I get go to a bounding box, search for that uh, projection options. Um, 
go and search here. So if I want a particular projection of this data set, I can choose that here. Um, I'm going to choose UTC for right now. Um, and if I want a particular band, the, the, the variable band, then I, then I can choose this. So once I have all this set here, I can then go ahead and, and download the data and it's going to stage that uh, all those granules for delivery. Um, in the essence of time, I already have, I'm going to go back to my presentation here and just kind of show you what I did. Um, oh, how to get back to my slides here. Uh, Okay. So okay, so 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 after I um, did all my search customizations with Earth Data Search, then I would uh, download my data and and all that would be staged for delivery, and I would get all the granular information. And from there, so for example, um, I downloaded that SMAP data um, as HDF. I use a, um, a desktop tool Planoply to basically give me all the information about that particular um, that particular data set. And here I can use this tool to then um, create a plot to visualize this data. So after I download that, I put it in the tool, uh, create a plot. And this is just, um, remember I did a search for the soil moisture and this is just a visual plot of that. So kind of what Jeff and Mark were talking about earlier, right? This whole paradigm of, of going through and doing all the, you know, science, how that takes a long time. The end to end services capability helps facilitate that and helps the users get to their data and do the science faster. So all that's driven by both the user experience and also the metadata models that we have within NASA's common metadata repository. And that's it. If um, I guess I have time again for questions. Thanks. All right. So we have uh, a little bit of time for questions. I'm just going to pop in to go to meeting and see if anyone has questions there. Nope. So we'll take any questions from the room uh, to anyone on the panel or generally uh, about Earth Science UX. All right. Yeah, there you go. Um, yes. That's okay. You, you kicked off this talk talking about your five users to 95% thing, and I didn't hear anybody else talk about UI UX testing with end users other than like people are using it, so they seem to like it. As like, what up, panelists with uh, UI testing with end users? We certainly test with Earth Data Search. <laughs> We certainly test. So yeah, one of my recommendations was definitely to sit sit someone down that has never used your application and, and watch them use it. Uh, my experience with uh, testing specifically Earth Data Search, uh, we've gone to a, a couple of different uh, DACs. Um, and I think that we in, we shoot for like 10 uh, each time that we've went. Um, and certain, like we would do five day one, five day two. And day two was a lot, we, we discovered a lot of the same things that, that we saw in day one. Uh, so what I've experienced um, out, out in the real world, real world certainly backs up uh, cert that, that five. Um, I think I think our specific challenge is when we go to a DAC, th those users are used to a very specific type of, of data, right? right. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge that we have is finding a representative set of five users or ten, whatever that number is. So, so I mean, I, I guess I wanted to hear from Tyler when they were doing the end-to-end the -end services, which is basically functionality that's been added to the Earth Data Search Client, um, you know, recently. How did that get shook out? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, there was, for the for the E2E Pathfinder, we did, we worked with Goddardac and also Podac. So we basically sat down with them and, and walked through 
the process of, you know, here's what we're doing with end to end, here's the UMM VAR, here's the UVG, and basically, you know, walked it through with them and they gave us a, a lot of feedback and iterated through that. And then we um, took that back to our teams and, and, and made some tweaks and changes to that and then put it back out to them and say, hey, is this what you wanted? So um, there, yeah, no, no. So the the origin of of end to end services actually started uh, well before we put it in front of a provider. So uh, the the providers are the end users of generating the the UMM var records, right, and, and the metadata uh, management tool MMT. The the end users to end to end services are scientists, the researchers, uh, academics, and so all of that the end to end services from from discovery to to generating the variables to to actually getting the data. Um, there were, were many, many studies and user interviews done uh, before any code was touched or any wireframes were mocked up, and it generated a, a white paper, right? And I think that was, took a year, six months to, to do. And so all of our decisions were based upon kind of user research, anecdotal research, um, talking with people at, at bars, at conferences, just like this, and it ended up into a white paper, which then informed uh, designs, wireframes, metadata models, uh, um, all the things that, that make end-to-end -end services. Yep. We didn't do any testing. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we have a slightly different, par like we're, we're addressing like open science platforms. So our primary users are, are research scientists. And I look at this idea of user testing um, or user experience from two, basically two angles. One, which uh, Mark already talked about, which is basically like we have use cases. So we, we work with scientists are part of the project to actually write the user stories, which are driving our development. And then there's going to be a user working group. So we're one thing I didn't mention is the map project is in a plot in a pilot stage, which is going to be delivered, you know, delivered to users in September. That's going to be delivered to a user working group, a small group of people that we're going to be working with. And one of the things that, you know, we, we have like a, a list of features that we want to develop for the full map. But one of the things, you know, I think is important to keep in mind, I think everybody agrees, is that those features should be highly, you know, sort of flexible prioritization wise, depending on what we hear back from that user working group. I guess this comes a little bit more of a comment than anything else, a suggestion for future maybe or something. I happened to end up, because of a number of different aspects to my job, going to an accessibility conference earlier this year. And one of the things that was interesting, because I heard it kind of keyed on, because you talk about like hit the 80% and then, you know, figure out the rest, is when you look at things where people have, for example, visual, you know, barriers to use of your interface and things like that, it can be very important to actually include some of those, what you think of as the 20% from the beginning, because sometimes it can be really hard to fix it to make it work for those folks. And so it's, it can be interesting. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that you get. I mean, and it feels like a stretch goal and I get that because that's how I was feeling as I was listening to the talks. But for example, just even for colored blindness, I mean, we're trying more and more nowadays to say, hey, let's, you know, make sure we're not using color scales that mean someone looks at it and it's like it's all one color i can't tell anything's going on so i just like i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on those sort of topics and yeah uh, that's a, that's a good point um and specifically with with government agencies like we're, we're required to to follow a lot of those standards so um specifically my team we're very lucky we have someone on our program that is colorblind so when he sees a design come across he's like nope doesn't work uh, we go back to the drawing board, so that that's really handy for us. Um, but a lot of times, like we don't have the the financial resources to to uh, to take the time to to flesh all that stuff out. So that goes back to my point: like we want to use standards as much as possible 
uh, specifically with those organizations that we know are, are, are putting a lot of effort into uh, accessibility uh, research. So, but, but yes, that is a, that is a very important port, uh, port point for us. One quick thing to add to that. So I generally would consider accessibility to be a part of that 80%. Like I don't consider accessibility for a web page to be like an edge case necessarily. Uh, I would sort of categorize that into a, there should be a, a kind of common standard of accessibility points that you hit on all of your projects. It should be as, uh, not as simple, but it should it should be as, yeah, it's, it's it's a core piece. It should just be like, you know, writing proper HTML markup and, you know, making sure you have tests written for your code. Like there should be a base level accessibility um, mark that you should hit. Uh, now, there are some accessibility edge cases that I might put into that 20%, but I think at a base level, especially colorblindness and, and some of those um, kind of primary accessibility goals, those, those should be included in that in that main 80%. So from uh, the, the kind of back end and software standpoint of things, uh, UX is, you know, your users oftentimes, as Jeff mentioned this, like the personas, I'm a consumer of data. So Amy specifically in this context, when I'm looking at like OGC uh, feedback on one of your slides, you mentioned that one of your challenges was that OGC is XML. And I wonder like something that I haven't heard mentioned quite often in any of the metadata discussions or anything in any of the ESIPs I've been to, is the actual format of the data, not necessarily the data that it comes in. So my question was, or is, kind of loaded, why is that a problem? Um, and my question is because a lot of the standards I I'm seeing are all XML. Uh, so when we were looking, we're looking at developing, for example, um, you know, uh, visualizations on top of like histograms on top of our you know the data that's coming back and a lot of the existing sort of clients or libraries are not developing you know visualizations using xml they're using json so if we're using something like the web coverage service which is actually like returning actual data that we want to build off of we have to develop you know basically json response like json adapters into those xml to to represent that data but in general, it's, yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not a blocker, right? Yeah, so I think, I agree. Um, and so I think that oftentimes when people see UX up on a slide or on a, a title of a presentation, everyone goes in expecting pictures of stuff. Um, whereas oftentimes like users are not necessarily people who are clicking on on a thing on a screen. Um, experience is, is deeper than that sometimes. So like basically, Maybe it's a, a suggestion. In the future, these things like can be focused on, and I love the fact that you are part of this because I think it's it's not a visual aspect of things as often. So it's just a key part of what I do every day is like reading XML is a pain in the neck. And I am a user of something, and that is not something, as much as we talk about standards and data here, the format of the data and who's using the data doesn't seem to be a topic of discussion. Yeah, and to that point, to the extent that XML scares people away, it's kind of a problem, right? Because standards, the whole point is that everybody's going to use them. And I think, you know, one of the ways that we're seeing that manifest is just maybe that there aren't more libraries built off of these standards. Um, but I also think that having them is critical for the interoperability that we've all been talking about. I mean, a lot of a lot of tools are built using these standards, and it just means you can like visualize data on different platforms, which is great. Okay, any other questions? All right, another round of applause for Mark, Amy, Grega, Tyler. Thank you guys. And that concludes our session. About five minutes early, you've got some time to get coffee. Uh, please feel free to grab any of us in the hallway or talk to us. We'll be here all week, as the saying goes. Uh, thank you very much.